Okay. Okay, this is module four, quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. just, just spin it on its axis as yep. well. Yeah. Like Jack Webb from Dragnet. That's my cultural <laughs> reference of the day. <laughs> and uh, it's great. And anytime, sir. Today we'll be talking about methods to quantitatively understand what users are doing in a particular system. This can help for any scale of study, whether you just have 10 users or you have 10 million users. There are many reasons why you might want quantitative data about use in an application. You might want to know what percent of your users are returning every day or every week. You might want to know where you lose users in certain interactions. Or you might want to know the most frequently used features or the sequence of use. Or you might want to see the impact of specific changes you make on user engagement over time uh, via an A-B test. There are many benefits to this. You can see data about actual use from all of your users, not just a sample that you might be able to talk to in person or in a survey. You can also see precisely what people are doing, every single click, every single interaction, and you can understand what people are doing uh, from a quantitative point of view, every click, every move they make in your application. And randomized controlled experiments, such as an A-B test, are really the gold standard to seeing how a change you make in an interaction affects behavior. So while there are a lot of benefits, there are also some limitations to choosing a purely quantitative approach. You only know what people are doing. You don't know why they're doing it. Um, and you don't know how they're doing it. You don't know how it's fitting into their context and into their life. All you know is that people open the app you know, on average twice a day, and they go into features X, Y, and Z in that order. But you don't really know how that's fitting into their patterns of life. So this can be, this can be complemented by qualitative met methods, which is what we'll cover in next week's class. So now we'll go into a detailed example using Flurry to look at the data that people are using. Yeah, we'll start there again. So let's yeah. pick it up. I'm going to go Do you want to go back we'll to go back one to limitations? Uh, yeah, to yeah. the very end of that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and we'll just pick it up from there. I'll bracket the Yeah, top. we'll do benefits and limitations cuz yep. those go together nicely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And anytime. So there are multiple benefits to using quantitative logging to understand a user experience. First, you get data about actual use. You see what every single user of your application is doing every click, every action they make. And so you can see precisely what they're doing. Also, when you consider A-B testing, those are randomized control experiments. Those are really the gold standard to understanding how a change that you make can impact behavior, can impact engagement, can impact retention, and other factors that are really important in a running application. But there are some limitations as well. You only get to understand what they're doing and not why and how they're doing it. So you miss the motivations, you miss the emotions, you miss the experience of users and actually why they're coming into your system every day. So that's why quantitative methods are best complemented with qualitative methods. And that'll be the focus of next week's class. So now we'll start on a specific example, looking at understanding quantitative behavior using Flurry. And this is for sort of a toy example, a small little prototype that we had made at Yahoo for an alarm application. And so this alarm application, when you woke up in the morning, it would give you some news stories, some finance stories, some sports stories, uh, your calendar, your email, and it was sort of fully configurable so you could pick what content you wanted in the morning. And it would be read out to you via text-to-speech on the device. And we just gave it to a few colleagues to use for a couple weeks, and that's the data that we'll be looking at here in Flurry. So you'll see that it's even useful if you just deploy something to a dozen users, um, as well as if you deploy something you know, fully on the web to hundreds of millions of people over time. So the most basic functionality in any kind of instrumentation solution is looking at how many active users you have per day. So the graph that's on the screen right now shows you how many users we had every single day of the application. 
you can see that we had kind of two to three users over time for the first couple weeks. And then you can see this big spike on the 19th where we gave it out to a bunch of our colleagues. And you can see that then after that, we have kind of three or four people using it a day after that. So obviously this is very small data, um, but you can also see how that sort of spike of giving it to a few colleagues then increased use over time. And we had a few more people who continued to use it over the Christmas holiday. So systems like this will also allow you to see which features are used. So as we talked about in the last module where we talked about instrumentation and logging, you can log specific events that people make in your application. So here we're looking at the specific features that people used, and we can see that skipping to the next content or jumping to a certain position are the most common actions performed in the application. We can also see that only 77 new alarms were set, yet there were many more alarms that were actually played. So the custom alarms were a key part of our concept, but in, the in fact, most people just stuck with the default alarm and played the default thing that was visible. But now we can jump into this in more detail. We can look at the parameters of that skip event, and we can see exactly which content users were skipping. As you can see in this graph, almost 3 quarters of the skips were on news content. So clearly we need to do a better job at personalizing news content in this system and getting people news that they actually wanted to hear about. Or maybe offering fewer news stories in the morning and getting on to other information in people's daily lives that's important. Maybe their calendar information, maybe their traffic on the commute to work, and, and kind of not focusing on so many news stories right away. So this very simple instrumentation, this very simple user data, has now given us multiple insights on how we might want to improve our system. And you can see how combining this with qualitative methods and actually asking people about some of the news stories they skipped could then give us even deeper insights to tell us what kind of news we should show and how many news stories it's appropriate to show in a particular interface. So for our users, clearly news, weather, finance, and calendar were important to them. Here you can see the different items that people actually listened to in the interface. So you can see that about half of the stories that were read to them were news. Um, oh, they're not actually news. OK, so we'll start at this. We can pick up right at this one, because these are all. Yeah, this is all in the graphic anyway, right? These, these are graphics. So yeah, we can pick up right after the last one. Yeah. OK. okay. Um, I'll show you on the Y chart, since we know mm -hmm. about the graphic anyway. Yeah. And uh, whenever you're ready. So we can also see the types of content that were played over time. For our users, clearly news, weather, finance, and calendar were important to them, while sports was much less popular. So now this could be um, due to the fact that we had other Yahoo employees using this, people who might not be as into sports as the general population. And that highlights the importance of getting a really broad user base when you're deploying an application and really understanding how a broad set of people will access the content and access the information that you provide in your, in your system. But for our particular users, news, weather, and finance were the top things that they wanted to look at. And these graphs uh, in this instrumentation can help us see the specific things that people were engaging with. So that's an example of instrumentation and analytics. Now let's explore A-B testing and why you might want to do an A-B test in your application. So you might want to do an A-B test if you're considering making a particular change to your system and you want to see how it impacts user engagement or retention over time. Often people will do A-B tests with various forms of onboarding in their system to see if explaining a certain feature or highlighting a certain part of the application when a user first starts to use the system changes their behavior in any given way. If they come back more often or if they use that feature that you're highlighting more than a group that did not receive that treatment. You might also want to use it if you're trying to increase engagement in the app or revisitation um, and you're really trying to, to get people to use your application more. You might tweak some little aspect of it run a randomized controlled experiment via an A-B test, and then you might look to see if you've increased those key metrics that you're trying to increase. So how do you run an A-B test? First, it's really important that you have a truly randomized sample. 
Maybe you want to take everybody who comes in on an even or an odd millisecond and give them one condition or the other. Maybe you want to take user IDs that are even or odd and put them in different conditions. Or take every tenth user ID and put them in a specific condition. Um, but it's really important that no matter how you're splitting your data, you have demographically similar samples and people who use your application in similar ways in each of your samples. Um, and then you're, you're running a truly randomized controlled experiment, and you can see the impact that the one specific change that you're making makes in their engagement and their retention in the application. So one group gets the experimental treatment, one group keeps the old way of doing things, and then you can look at changes in each group. You can measure the behavior of both groups separately. For example, you could set a flag or a parameter in your instrumentation to say that somebody's in a particular experiment or not. And then you can look at the group that was in the experiment and the group that wasn't in the experiment and see if there are statistically significant differences. You can also look to past behavior before your experiment started to confirm that both groups had similar interactions before being given the treatment condition for the particular experiment. And then you can statistically compare to see if any differences you find are statistically significant and meaningful increases in engagement or retention or whatever metrics you're trying to follow. So it's really important to understand the effects of engagement based on design changes. So like I said, onboarding flows are one example where people often make these changes, where you're seeing a particular feature isn't being used as much as you might like it to be, and then you can teach people how to use it, either in initial onboarding or in a contextual help that pops up the first time they get on a screen that has that feature. And then you can see how that impacts engagement. And it might not always be positive. If you're providing too many hints and too many overlays and too much help, that could also drive people away. So you want to make sure that even if engagement in a particular feature goes up, your overall retention is not going down. You can also look at things like changing the color or the size of a particular button and seeing if that changes the, Im the amount of users who engage with it. Or if you think you have an icon that might be hard to understand, you can change that icon and see if you get more people engaging with it over time. Often these are really subtle changes. These are things that it would be really hard to identify in a usability test. They're really these kind of subconscious interactions that people have where they might click on something just a fraction of a percent more. But if you have hundreds of millions of users coming to your site every day, even increasing interaction by a percent might make a huge difference in your over overall revenue and overall engagement in the system. So running an A-B test is really the only way to see these small increases in engagement that you might get by implementing a certain feature or changing a particular design element. So overall, good instrumentation, analytics, and A-B testing can help you to quantitatively understand what people are doing in your application and how changes that you make impact user engagement over time. However, this is really only half the picture. Understanding why and how people are engaging with your application can often show you exactly what changes you need to make or exactly how to make those changes to increase engagement, to increase the fun people are having interacting with your system and make them come back even more to have positive experiences. And that'll be the focus of next week's lecture, really looking at the qualitative data you can collect with diary and field studies and how you can combine this with the quantitative data from instrumentation to improve your user experience over time.